Hi. Pop, relax. How's it going? How's everyone doing today? How's the audio? How's the video? How's the weather? It gets dark, doesn't it? It gets dark real quick. Thank you. You know what I you know what I got last year though? I, I bought this um this light that wakes you up. Um it's just a big globe, it's a Philips light, but you can time it so that if you want to wake up at six or whenever you wake up, it'll start shining at five thirty and then um it starts very dim and then eventually it gets up to like a sunrise. Actually really nice to have when it gets uh dark. Because I found that Getting out of bed can be quite difficult um, if it's dark. So I highly recommend it. I think you can get cheap ones. Um, the cheap ones do feel a little bit cheap, but it's worth, if you have an Amazon Prime subscription, then you can try to, um, you can just try a, a couple. But I found that it, it, it actually does legitimately help wake up. I got it on a big online reseller that we all know. Someone stole your bins. I think you have to go to the council website and uh, ask for a new, a new bin. The blue sacks, cardboard sacks. Are you talking about accommodation? You mean your, um, you mean the, the council rubbish bins? Black sack. You don't get, you do not get bins, you get, you get sacks. I guess if you live in town, you get, uh, you get bags or something. We have big bins. We have big black bins. That's true. It is very hilly. It is strange for people to be stealing bins. Why would they be stealing bins? Now, video quality. Oh, do you know I, I put the video. Um, there's when I when I make the videos or when I'm streaming the videos, I can I can specify a certain bit rate. You know what that is. Just the amount of data that you send. And I put it up from 2,500 to 2,700. And I don't know, the, the question is, uh, for those of you who are on so, slower connections, then if I put it up, does it, does it lag on your connection? And I wasn't sure, but I thought it, was, it seemed to work well last time. Find someone with a car. Or just fill your pockets with the rubbish and then bring them to the university. <laughs> and dump them at the university.
like from the Shawshank Re Redemption, you can just every day you just fill one handful of rubbish and bring it to the university. <laughs> well, I've been doing guard. Um, I've been doing. Uh, home renovations and actually getting rid of your stuff, getting rid of actual rubbish, not not just garbage, is a big issue, right? Um, soil and stone and all that stuff. And I have thought, oh, maybe I'll just like stuff my pockets full of rubbish and then sprinkle it on the way to the university. All right, all right, all right. Okay, should we get started? I do try to make the videos short. You, you don't know that, but I do try. I mean, every time I edit the videos and it comes out to be an hour, my heart breaks. But uh, it's actually really hard. I find it quite hard to be brief. Okay, so um, welcome to week three. We're now... In week three, it's the start of the MIGs. Let me say a few words about um, the MIGs. You've not heard very much about the MIGs because I'll find out what we're going to be doing tomorrow because I'm going to be sorting out tonight. Um, but the MIG sessions will be starting this week. We have sessions on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, there are three tutors who will be handling the MIGs, myself, uh, Karsten, and Juan. And this week, I think I'll actually be doing all of the Tuesday sessions. So if you're on Tuesday, you're with me. Um, our focus this week is going to be about getting you to come to grips with MATLAB. So uh, you might have received in your email a little MATLAB video I made um, showing you how to get the program installed on your computer. It's only three minutes long, and you can watch that and get it installed. That's an excellent idea of editing the playback speed. Maybe I should do that. Thank you. I did try, I did, I, I did try editing uh, playback speed, by the way, with my course last year. And then I edited it. I think it was too fast. And I don't know what they might have had to slow it down. So I, I found actually that sometimes it doesn't help. But maybe a 1.3 tweak or a 1.2 tweak would, would be much appreciated. MIG 5 is on Wednesday. Um, Jake, I don't know. I'm going to, I'll double check after this lecture for your sake and for my sake as well. I thought I had the times correct, but, uh, or maybe the, the, the group numbers are wrong, but I'll, I'll double check um, and send me an email if it continues to be wrong. Okay, so uh, things about the MIGs. Come to the MIGs if you're intending to come to the MIGs. Bring your laptop, or if you don't have a laptop, bring a tablet. If you don't have a tablet, maybe bring a phone. I think you might be able to do something with a phone, but I am I will be thinking about how we do the MIGs, even if you don't have any of these devices. But the most useful for device is for you to bring a laptop. I've always said to basically all students, all undergraduate students, that if you bring back, if you ask, um, former undergraduate students to come back after they go to industry and you ask them, well, what's the one thing you regret in your math degree? Almost universally, the ones who didn't do any coding will just say, we really regret not learning that. So um, it, I know you took your first year course on MATLAB and we're going to be uh, doing MATLAB throughout the lectures and throughout the MIGs as well. It's not a testable component of the course in the sense that you're not going to get assessed on MATLAB. You won't get a, a, an exam problem on MATLAB, but it's going to really help you think about many of the problems and many of the theory um, that we discuss in the lectures. So I think it's a really good chance for you uh, to learn some of these issues. Not doing more code? Okay. Um, right, so watch the video, get set up with MATLAB. Hopefully, if you're coming to the MIG and you're coming with a laptop, 
then you'll have it installed. If not, then there's the facility um, not to use MATLAB on your computer. You have that MATLAB online. If that's confusing, watch the video and you'll see a little demo of that. Uh, all the MIGs, no, not all the MIGs. I'm going to make sure that at least one of the MIGs will be recorded. So um, I'm, I have to discuss with the other tutor what happens to the other MIGs, whether we want to record all uh, five sections of it. I don't actually know whether it's that useful for you to see five sections of the same thing. So we might decide just to record one section, but at least one section every week in which the MIG is offered will be recorded. And I don't know what, how that's going to work in terms of the room layout and how that's going to work in terms of the interaction we do with the students. I did not say where the MIG is going to be because it's in University Hall. I didn't know that. It's in University Hall. Any other questions about the MIG? It's weird. I feel really nervous. Like, first time meeting everybody. I don't think I'm ready for that. I'll send a reminder. Uh, if it's not in University Hall, then I'll send a reminder. How do you find out which one I am? I don't know. Pick one, of, one out of five. One out of five. Two out of five. I'm doing two out of five. Okay, good. So it looks like the times were, were correct. Should we get started on today's uh, lecture? I'll see if I can uh, send out an email about just to summarize where the MIGs are and the timings and what to bring and all that stuff in a separate email. But I'm also conscious you get so many crappy emails from the university already. You don't want more emails from me. Okay. Um, right. Any announcements in terms of the bulletin board? Not really. I'm still answering questions. People who are participating in the bulletin board are still getting um, answers to those questions. So if you have questions, then of course you can email me or you can put it on the bulletin board. Uh, there's no new course notes. So the course notes that we had um, from last week are still there. Chapters five and six, this is what we're going to be working through um, today and Wednesday and Friday. Uh, I think your problem set ones are, have been marked. Um, I had a very brief look on the Moodle facility. I think those of you who handed it in would hopefully get an email that says it's been submitted for, uh, that it's been graded. If not, then I think we're just missing, we haven't pressed some final button yet. Uh, but there are comments up there for you. If you haven't gotten uh, a response yet, then let me know in the chat. Sorry, a response to your Moodle submission if you submitted something on Moodle. Okay, and let's get started. Right. Feeling very disorganized today. Okay, so let me uh, first get started with just showing you where we are in, in Chapter 5. Last class, we, we looked at the expansion of this F function into its Taylor series, in, into its two dimensional ta Taylor series. So it goes up in powers of x, then mu, and x squared, and x mu, and so forth, and so on. And we split the analysis about the fixed point. So we said about when you study about a fixed point, if the fixed point is, has been shifted to 0, 0 uh, for x and for mu, then your analysis is split into two cases. You have uh, case a, a, in which you have the gradient of the function fx, x sub x is 1, and you have case b. And case B will eventually lead to our analysis of the period doubling bifurcation. Um, and then case A is the saddle node, transcritical, and pitchfork bifurcations. This is the SN, TC, and BF. And we started doing the dominant balance, and we derive the fixed points for the saddle node bifurcation. Um, and that's kind of where we left it. We didn't go through this particular example. So this is where we're going to pick up. We're going to pick up with this example 5.1. Um, actually, I'm going to do a very quick review of, of this derivation of the dominant balance, and then we're going to go on and do the transcritical bifurcation. Okay? Right. So, uh, this was the key equation that we left off last time. And uh, in the event that this uh, derivative, so remember that this is the derivative term, the number that multiplies this x is fx at 0, 0. In case A, that fx of 0, 0 is 1, and then you get to cancel the, the x's from both sides. 
And this is the part of the um, demo I remember when I did the lecture. It, it was a little bit rocky. And I meant to go and I meant over the weekend to go and edit out my mistakes, but then I got a bit lazy. So now you're looking to solve this equation, which is an infinite series in theory. If for, for, for a particular function, it might not be an infinite series. So the point here is that you know all these coefficients. You know them because you can always take the derivatives of the function and substitute in the point zero, 0, and you can calculate them. Um, for, a for a generic function, it might uh, be infinite, this um, Taylor series expansion. For very simple functions, it might be finite. So this Taylor series might actually truncate at a point. Sorry, after a certain number of terms. And you want to solve this by, essentially, or you want to approximate solutions to this by basically performing different dominant balances of these quantities. That's the basic idea. So in, in, the, in, the, in the simplest scenario, this a1 mu, this 1, will then balance the 2. And we went through the logic of why that has to be. And in this scenario, you need a1 and b0 b not, not to be equal to 0, because if they are equal to 0, then this balance no longer works. And so you balance 1 and 2 at leading order, and you get x is basically plus or minus root of minus a1 mu over b0. Okay? And then once you have this approximation, then you can substitute it into 3 and 4 and 5 and so on, and to make sure that they are indeed smaller than 1 and 2. And so this assumption was correct. Okay, so now that you have this thing here, let's imagine what it looks like. The point is that if minus a1 over b0 is greater than 0, then for mu greater than 0, this will always be a real and well-defined quantity. And you have always two branches of these fixed points. So you have the way that you plot it is that you, you draw a little diagram of mu and x like this. And you essentially plot the locations of the fixed points. This is giving you an approximation of the fixed points. And in the case that minus a1 over b0 is greater than 0, you know that there's one branch here, which is like minus, uh, which is like plus minus a1 over b0 times root mu. And remember, this is just a constant, this thing here. And then you'll have another branch here, which is minus a1 over b0 root mu. Okay? So there's no fixed points on the left, no fps, and uh, we'll call this a saddle nose. So this little arrow here, and in your diagrams, whenever you do your bifurcation diagrams, you write a little sn, or you write a tc, or whatever the, the bifurcation classification is. So you write next to the key point, you write the classification of the bifurcation. In addition to that, for this diagram, you might be doing dashed lines or solid lines, depending on whether the, the fixed point is stable or unstable. Uh, and, but at this point, we haven't done the analysis, so we don't know. So we're just going to leave them solid for now. Okay? Now, in the event that this thing here is less than zero, then the, then the picture simply reverses. If this thing here is less than zero, then mu needs to be negative in order for this thing here to be well-defined and real. And that gives you a picture that looks like that. So this is our graph of mu, and this is our graph of x. And this will be basically um, a constant times root mu, negative root mu, and a, a, a constant minus a constant times negative root mu, like that. I shouldn't, I mean, here, sorry, this constant here is just that quantity there without the negative. Okay, and again, you would make this point clear in the diagram, and you say Sn because it's a saddle node bifurcation. So a saddle node bifurcation, well, I'm going to write, I haven't kind of, I, I've just told you that when this case happens, you're going to call this a saddle node. I actually haven't written down the definition of a saddle node bifurcation. But the saddle node bifurcation is defined um, in the way that we explained it. A saddle node bifurcation is a point at x and mu such that when mu is less than some value, you have no fixed points. And then when mu is greater than some value, you have two fixed points. So it's a situation where you go from zero fixed points to two fixed points as mu uh, 
increases. Or you can also have the reverse situation where you go from 2 to 0 as mu increases, or 0 to 2 as mu decreases. So you have 0 on one side and two fixed points on the other side. And I guess that's because that's such an important thing. Uh, I'll write that out properly, and then we'll do an example. Remember that all of these are approximations, right? You haven't, you haven't discovered anything about the function outside of a, a, a little ball around 0, 0. You're just doing a local approximation because this series expansion is only, there's plus dot 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 here, this series expansion and the ordering of the, the progression of the terms as they get smaller and smaller, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, they're getting smaller and smaller. This is only valid near 0, 0. So it's a local analysis near that point. Okay? So a saddle node bifurcation um, is a point, I guess, let's call it. I think we used x, I don't remember, x star or is it x naught? I don't remember. x star and mu naught. I remember someone asking why did you go from x naught to mu naught or x naught to x star and mu naught to mu star, but I don't remember what notation is used um, in your lecture notes on that. It's a point x star and mu star where the system changes uh, from um, uh, zero fixed points to two fixed points uh, about mu is equal to mu star. I was hopeful someone in the chat would tell me whether I use x naught or mu naught in the lecture notes. Okay, so it's the simplest situation, the one balancing two, and let's look at an example. Let's look at an example for this. So in the notes, uh, in the notes, you'll see that we go through different examples, and this example 5.1, this term canonical kind of just means like the, uh, the prototypical example of a saddle node bifurcation, the simplest example of a saddle node bifurcation. And so you go through prototypical or canonical examples. Uh, this is actually, um, there's, a, there's an error here. This should, should say transcritical bifurcation. I just copied and pasted. This should say canonical tra transcritical bifurcation. So that's basically the flavor of this chapter, going through um, prototypical examples of each of these bifurcations. The prototypical uh, uh, saddle node bifurcation uh, I guess this is example 5.1 is uh, mu plus x, so f is equal to mu plus x minus x squared. Okay? And uh, so at, later on in the course, I mean at this point on, we're not going to bother writing these kinds of things, but Remember that this f just specifies the way that you perform the, um, the equation for the dynamical system. OK, so uh, let's look at some numerical examples of this, and then we'll do the analysis. OK, so I, I've gone to this GeoGebra um, cobweb plotter just because I find it quite easy. If you want to play with this cobweb plotter, then I've put up a link for you if you go to the Moodle site here um, under this MATLAB. Um, heading is now listed as online cobweb plotter. So you can just go there or you can just look it up. It, I think if you put in GeoGebra um, cobweb plotter on Google, you'll find this link. Okay, so this is our canonical um, saddle node bifurcation example, mu plus x minus x squared. And we're essentially going to look at the behavior near mu is equal to zero, right? The fixed point is located, the special behavior is located near mu is equal to zero. So when mu is negative here, minus 0 
and I start at a point x naught here. By the way, just uh, in case it's not obvious. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you for that. Okay, so uh, I've now gone to this GeoGebra website. We're putting in the um, the canonical saddle node example of mu plus x minus x squared, and we're going with a negative value of mu. So you start off with this x naught, and you iterate this. And just by the way, um, we're not confining ourselves. So the domain of interest here is essentially the region around x equal to zero. Okay, not the positive numbers. So. If I start off with this value of x0 and I just do the cobweb diagram, you'll see it's basically unstable. So this x0 here will eventually go off to minus infinity. And it's not a very interesting system. Okay? So now the question is, well, what happens if I begin to decrease this value of mu? Well, this is the uh, y-intercept in the problem. right? So when this y-intercept moves uh, to be equal to 0, you're, you're going to have an intersection at x equal to 0. So um, let's have a look at that. In fact, I'm not going to, I'm going to go slightly to the right of that point. Okay, so this graph steadily moved up. And remember the graph, the intersections with the red line give you the fixed points of the system. So when mu moves through zero, the graph, the parabola, will just kiss the origin here. It'll kiss the red line at that point, and you see that at every subsequent uh, value of mu greater than zero, you now have two intersections. You have one on the left and one on the right. Okay. All right. So now let's look at um, let's look at the graph. Okay, let's look at the graph. We're going we're gonna to look more carefully at this graph after having created the two fixed points. So you have a fixed point on the left here, a negative fixed point, and you have a fixed point on the right. Now, look at the gradient of this blue line here. You notice how the gradient of this blue line is actually greater than the gradient of the red line. So you also remember from our initial investigation of cobwebbing, that when the gradient of this blue line is greater than the gradient of the red line, then the, the fixed point, so when I start the simulation near the fixed point, it will move away from that fixed point. It's an unstable point, right? The criterion is that the gradient has to be less than one if it's to be stable. So if I were to start near this last fixed point, just by looking at this picture, you would come to the conclusion that you're going to be unstable. This point is unstable. And if uh, you don't believe me? I don't know whether can. Can I move this x? Oh yeah, I can. There we go. So I'm going to move this x a little bit closer to that point. And you notice that for this x naught, it's moving away from that point. So this point is an unstable fixed point. On the other hand, look at this uh, right intersection point. The right intersection point has a gradient. The blue line, the gradient of the blue line, is less than the gradient of the red line. So the gradient of the blue line is less than one and you expect this point here to be stable. So now if I move the initial point up closer to that intersection point, you'll notice the trajectory moves into the fixed point. So you have a stable uh, on the right here and an unstable fixed point. You've gone from a system having zero fixed points. This, when this was minus 0.1, you were below, there was no intersections, there was no fixed points, it was unstable, and then you have a creation of two fixed points as soon as this mu passes, uh, mu is equal to zero. Now, a little bit further away, if I go to 0 0.8 here, and I zoom out of the graph, okay. Now again, we can just do the analysis, we don't even have to follow the cobwebbing, we just have to look at the gradient. Look at the gradient of the left blue uh, intersection, the, 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 the gradient of the blue line versus the gradient of the red line. As mu continues to increase, this gradient will continue to increase. It gets steeper and steeper, the blue curve. And because this curve gets steeper and steeper, it's going to continue to be unstable. So you knew from the onset, well, you knew from this little investigation, or you, you've observed that 
when mu first passes through mu is equal to zero, the left fixed point looks to be always unstable, and it gets worse as mu increases because this gradient gets larger and larger, which means you're always driven away from the fixed point, right? So if I bring this point x, you see you're always driven away. If I start at x here, I land at x over on the right. You're always driven away from that. Now look at the gradient of the, um, of the intersection on the right. Well, when mu was less than this value, say mu is 0 0.2, okay, then you notice that this uh, intersection was, well, firstly, you notice that the, the gradient of mu here was positive, but you also notice that it's pretty shallow, right? It's a pretty uh, shallow gradient. But then when mu starts to increase, it starts to increase, this gradient. It's getting bigger and negative, right? Now, if I take mu to be 1, right? Well, you actually see something in the, in the picture. You see this box that forms? This box tells me that mu is getting, uh, sorry, the, the iterations are jumping between two values, very close to jumping between two values. So if I run these iterates even further and further, let's, we'll be able to see here. You see how it's jumping from very close to 0 0.87 to 1.1, 1 0.87, 1.1, sorry, 0 0.88, 1.1, 0 0.88, 1.1, so forth and so on. It's getting very and very close to a two cycle. You see? And the magic number happens when this gradient is exactly at minus one. That's the creation of the two cycle. That's a, some, that's a thing that we're going to study in chapter six, right? But the point is that if mu were to increase even further than this, right, what happens if mu increases to 1.5? Well, you, you sort of know, you can anticipate what's going to happen. This graph is going to get even higher, higher, of course, because mu is the intercept, right? Mu is the intercept. So when this intercept continues to rise, this gradient on the right will continue to get even more negative, larger and negative, right? And then eventually it's going to be less than minus 1, and then it's going to be unstable. So if I take mu to be 1.5, for instance, here, you see now this gradient is large and negative, and you can bet that it's going to be unstable from that point. And that's what you're seeing from these cobwebs. It's, it first moves away from the leftmost fixed point because that one's unstable, and then it moves towards the right, but then it starts to spiral away from the right. So that's the interesting thing that we won't be studying in this chapter. How is it that you're unstable from the left one, but you're also unstable from the right one? What does that actually mean? Well, it means that actually there has to be something between the two fixed points which is not a fixed point, but which is still attracting the orbits anyways, okay? That's the basic idea. All right, so um, let's do some analysis of this problem. Now that we have an understanding of what the numerical picture is, let's uh, follow through with the analysis and just confirm that it is a saddle node bifurcation. Sorry. Okay, so uh, you're going to split this. Whenever you do this kind of analysis, you're going to split it up into, into two, two bits. You're going to first find the fixed points, and then you're going to check their stability. Okay, so first you find the fixed points, and you have to solve x equal to f of x. So in this case, you want to solve x equal to mu plus x minus x squared. You cancel the two x's from either side, and now you're left with mu is equal to, x is equal to plus or minus root mu. You see, this is an example, by the way, don't get confused between the difference between this analysis here and the analysis that we just did in a minute ago. The analysis that we just did a minute ago was an approximation. We took a series, we expanded it out, uh, we, we took a function, expanded it out into an infinite series, and then approximated the roots. This is an exact uh, value for the roots, and we can only do this because of course, the function was sufficiently simple. Okay, so now that you found your fixed points, I'm going to call one plus, the, I'll call the other one minus, and then what you want to do is you want to just uh, study their stability. So to study the stability of the fixed points, you take the derivative, the x derivative of the function, and then you substitute in those values, and you just check is the magnitude uh, 
of that derivative of that gradient uh, greater than one or less than one. And it's unstable if it's greater than one, stable if it's less than one. So you want to check the stability. Uh, so you're going to take the gradient f sub x, and this gives you 1 minus 2x. And then you substitute in either the plus 1 or the minus 1, and then you just check that. So f sub x of x plus is then 1 minus 2 uh, root mu. And you want to check basically whether this has a magnitude less than 1 or greater than 1. Uh, so, so uh, I did a bit of a, of, of a baddie here. Here, always make sure you state the domain where your fixed point exists. So here, mu greater than 0 means that these fixed points exist. So th those were the left and right fixed points that we found um, in our numerical investigation. Okay, so if mu here is greater than zero, uh, then fx of x plus is less than one, and so therefore this tells you it's stable. So the rightmost uh, fixed point is stable if mu is greater than zero, okay? Um, and if mu is less than zero, you don't have to worry about it because if mu is less than zero, then this thing here doesn't exist, okay? Now, you'll also notice that this thing here, if mu is huge, and it doesn't have to be that big, if mu is sufficiently large, that thing there may pass through minus one. So I'm going to write this little comment here. So note, in fact, fx of x plus uh, equal to minus 1 tells you that basically 1 minus 2 root mu is equal to minus 1. So that tells you that mu is equal to 1. So when mu is equal to 1, you're going to pass through to the other side of the gradient being less than 1. And at that point on, you're always unstable, okay? So that was, uh, if, I, if you remember in the picture that we showed you before, that was when this value of mu here is then goes through 1. This gradient goes from being shallow to then being sufficiently negative to be, for this gradient to be minus 1, and then the point is unstable. However, in this analysis here, because we're just interested in the local analysis near the point, when we do this kind of local analysis, we don't typically worry about these ones here. So in the notes, when, when you look at the notes, you'll often notice that when we talk about these canonical examples, we don't mention those um, values of mu away from zero, where the point changes its stability, okay? But for here, because we can solve the equation exactly, we can do this analysis exactly. When we can't do this, are situations where you can actually solve for the fixed point and you can only get an approximation of the fixed point. So you conclude that um, the range of mu, I'll, I'll just do it with a graph here. So this is mu. If, if mu is less than zero, there are no fixed points, no fixed point x plus. If mu is greater than zero, in this region here, from 0 to 1 is really crappy graph. From 0 to 1 here, uh, it's stable. And then out, outside this region, it's unstable. Okay, it's not a very good graph. I'll, I'll make a better graph in a second. Okay, now you're going to go and do the same thing, but you're going to substitute in the other point there. Yeah, so you're going to take a derivative of f and then substitute in the x minus point. Which is 1 minus uh, 2 times negative root mu. But for whatever value of mu greater than 0, this thing here uh, is always basically positive. Uh, greater than 1, sorry. It's greater than 1 for all mu greater than 0. 
So this is always unstable. Okay. Okay, so now that you've done the analysis, uh, what you do is then you make your bifurcation diagram. So you make one axis with x, one axis with mu, and then you go and you plot these curves here. You found the fixed points. You found that one was root mu, the other one was negative root mu. So this one here is root mu. This one here is negative root mu. All right, and I realize I want to get my stability before I, uh, I just want to summarize the stability before I draw that curve. And before mu is equal to zero, you don't have any fixed points, so that there are no fixed points here. You go and label that point to be a saddle node bifurcation. It's a creation from zero to two fixed points. And you also draw the stability if you like. So um, I'll do one here. I know that from zero to one, it's stable, like that. And then outside of that interval, I know that the stability of that point there changes to be a unstable point. On the other hand, I know that the curve on the bottom there, that, that's x minus, I know that curve is always unstable, regardless of the value of mu in its region of existence. So you always draw this curve to be dashed, like that, you see? Okay. Now as I warned you in the notes, let me now switch to the notes. I warned you that uh, in these pictures here, because these pictures are about the local analysis near the point, this is just a, it's an incomplete analysis, if you like. These pictures don't include the point where the stability of the top fixed point changes to be unstable. Okay? This is just a zoomed in picture, if you like, of this region near the origin. Okay? Now, the other uh, thing to note is that the, this function here, you could solve for everything, right? It was simple enough that you can go and find your fixed points. You can go, it was no issue for us to put in derivatives and then to solve these equations where the derivative either passes through one or passes through minus one, right? But if I gave you a function which was complicated, you know, so something that involves like exponentials or sinusoidals or other transcendental functions, something that you couldn't go and solve this equation, the point is that you can still do a local expansion near zero, zero, and you can still try to do this analysis, and you would end up with the same picture. You'd end up with exactly the same picture here, maybe tilted the other way, right? But it's, a, it's, it's the version of the full bifurcation diagram, which is only applicable at that zero, zero point. Okay, let's go on. I end up, uh, I end up talking so much that I don't get as, through as much as I should. Okay, now we've done the A1 analysis. This is the saddle node bifurcation analysis. We've done a toy example of that. Now we go to the next simplest example. And in the next simple example, we're, I think this is called, yeah, it's transcritical and A2. You're going to assume that this A1 is equal to zero. So A2 example, TC. Let's assume that A1 is equal to zero. And you're going to assume that uh, B0 is not equal to zero. So you, as you can imagine, there's lots and lots of possible combinations to go through. So when we talk about, so the question has come up with, is, what, uh, what do you mean by stability? And uh, so Jake has asked this question, do you mean Lyapunov stable or quasi-asymptotically stable? And for that, there's a reference in the notes. And in the notes, I think it's, it's mentioned the fact that for the examples that we're working with, if the magnitude of f is less than one or greater than one, then it's always essentially um, both quasi-asymptotically stable and Lyapunov stable. I have to verify that statement, but you can refer to the notes 
but that's a good question. So I think that when, when I say stability for these examples, I mean both Lyapunov and quasi-asymptotically. It's going to always approach the point or move away from the point, um, and it's going to, you know, so stays near, starts near, stays near, or eventually tends to. Okay, so the next uh, hardest example for us to look at is the example where we ignore this one term, and now we have two, three, and four. And again, when you apply the method of dominant balance, you're going to assume that some of these things are in balance. And the question for the trick is for you to pick which ones are going to be in balance. So the simplest example, the, the simplest balance that we can try to do is two balancing three. You might say, well, why don't you try three and four? Well, because two happens before three. So I have no reason. There's often no intuition. You just try it to begin with, and then you see about the consistency. So if I balance two and three, let's just try it in our heads. If I balance 2 and 3, well, I'll write on the board, then I have something like b naught x squared balancing minus b1x mu. And then if I solve for the x, and I, I, I ignore the trivial one, I have something like x balancing mu. Now, if x is balancing mu, then this 4 term, which is a mu squared, will then be the same order as 2, right? Because if x is like mu, then x squared is like mu squared, and 2 will be the same size as 4. So I can't have a 2, 3 balance unless 4 is also included in the mix. So that will be my shot. I'm going to assume that's going to be bigger than 5, 6, and so forth and so on. Remember, you just try these balances, and then you check that they're consistent. Okay. So you're going to balance 2, 3, and 4 together. This tells you that you're going to solve uh, b naught x squared plus b1 times x mu plus b2 mu squared till the 0. I should say that officially in asymptotics notation, you should never do till the 0. You're always balancing something that's not 0. Um, so if I want to be if I want to apply that rule of never uh, doing a tilde zero, I should really move that to the right-hand side. But we're going to violate that here because you understand what I mean by that. So this will give you an approximation of the solutions of that equation when a1 is equal to zero, b0 is not equal to zero, and x and mu are small. You go and solve this thing here, so this is just a quadratic equation, and I have negative b um, times mu, b1 times mu, plus or minus root, and I think I want to do a delta here. I want to make the notation a little bit. Um, oh, I'm, I'll write out the whole thing, okay? So b squared, that's the b1 squared, mu squared, minus 4ac, b naught times b2 times mu squared, over 2a, 2 times b naught, like that, you see? Okay. So now the trick is I'm going to factor out the mu from here, and I'll also factor out the mu from here. And I'll do it uh, on the same line, if that's confusing. So we're going to factor out this mu squared. It becomes, you just take the square root of that. So that mu will come out. This mu squared will come out. In fact, I'm going to call this whole thing delta, just for simplicity. So this will be a b1 plus or minus root delta over 2 times a in brackets like this, and then we factor out the mu like that. Okay, and this delta is basically the part of the discriminant. So this b1 squared minus 4ac, b0, b2. Okay, so this forms our approximation of the solutions of that equation. And as usual, you want to ve verify that this is consistent. So you need to make sure that the terms that you ignored in this balance 2, 3, and 4 together, you have to make sure that the terms that you ignored 5 and 6 are indeed small. So for instance, 5 here is like an x cubed, right? And this is like mu. So the approximation that you've come up with is saying that x is on the same size as mu. So if x is on the same side as mu, then x cubed is on the same side as mu cubed, right? 
and mu cubed will be smaller than mu squared and mu squared and mu squared. And so five is indeed smaller than two, three, and four. And you can go and do that check for the other terms as well. So you can say note here five, which is on the order of x cubed, is now, if this solution is to be believed, is on the order of mu cubed, and mu cubed is much smaller than two, three, and four. Because two, three, and four are all on the size of mu squared by assumption. Okay, so someone has asked, uh, can you explain again why, uh, why the balancing of two and three wouldn't work? It's not that the balance of two and three doesn't work, but it's that the balance of two and three without four won't work. You have to include four. So uh, you're happy with this, let's just go through the logic again. Suppose that I claimed that two balances three, was much larger than four and five and six and so forth and so on. If I balance two and three together and I try to solve that equation there, I'm going to come to the conclusion that x is of order essentially mu. x is proportional to mu. But if x is proportional to mu, then four is a mu squared, of course. And if four here is order mu squared, but then that's the same order as one and two, sorry, of two and three. So that violates that assumption, that four, this assumption says four has to be much smaller than two and three. The point is you have to include four if you're gonna balance two and three together. Okay? So that's why it's good to go through the consistency checks. You could have, it wouldn't have been wrong for you to go as a first assumption. If, I mean, it's not that obvious from a first go that two, three, and four should be in balance. Maybe you're just gonna work with your numbers two at a time. And so you start off and you say, I'm gonna think, I think two and three are in balance. You come to the conclusion that four, in order for two and three to be in balance, four needs to be included in the mix. And then you have to solve two, three, and four all together. Okay, now, uh, so you've come up with an approximation of that root, and I'll have to write it again because I've just uh, erased it, and the approximation was that x tilde uh, minus, b, minus b1 plus or minus root delta here over 2b0, and in fact, I'm just going to match the, the, the version of the notes the version of the notes is a minus mu. It's factored out the negative from the front here. So if you're trying to uh, write these notes at home, this, this is not the same line as I wrote before. There's no difference. You can factor the negative here. It just flips the sign as plus or minus. So I'm going to call x plus or minus to be the signs in that order. Okay. Now, then you have to ask yourself, where does that exist? Where does this solution exist? This exists for all mu. For mu greater than zero and for mu less than zero, that's the point. So the point is that this prediction of the two fixed points, if you were to draw the bifurcation diagram, let's draw the bifurcation diagram. Well, what, what, they look, what do they look like? Well, they, they're always just proportional to mu, so it's always going to go through the origin, okay? And these are just, this is just a number. They're two different numbers, right? Depending on what you have for the plus and minus, and depending on what all these different numbers are. But the point is that you're going to have one line here, which is going to be the plus line, let's call this x plus, and you can have another line here, which is the x minus line, okay? So it's a situation in which you have two fixed points which remain two fixed points, but there's something that's going to happen with their stability. Okay. All right, now I, I want to end the lecture in, in the next couple of minutes, so I'm not going to actually go through the details of, uh, of looking at the stability that we have to do that on Wednesday, uh, but I'm going to show you basically the numerics. I'm going to show you the canonical example of this bifurcation. And if I refer to the course notes, 
Uh, where, where are my notes? Here we go. Chapter 5, we're going to go through this analysis here. This is the canonical, I have to correct this, this should say transcritical bifurcation. This is the canonical one. 1 plus mu times x minus x squared. And so I put that into this plotter here. 1 plus mu, uh, 1 plus mu times x minus x squared, right? Here we go. 1 plus mu times x minus x squared. Here my mu is negative, okay? So for this negative value of mu, look at the picture, okay? Here we are. So the, the picture, well, uh, you, you see from this that x equal to zero is always a fixed point. I can solve this equation equal to x, and x equal to zero itself always satisfies this, uh, the fixed point equation. So that's why there's intersection uh, at zero here. You also have a fixed point on the negative side here. Okay, now again, look at the gradients of everything's going on. So firstly, the fixed point on the left here, you notice that the gradient is uh, steep, yeah? This is a steep gradient compared to the red line. It's going higher than the red line. So you know that the fixed point, if we're gonna move this x over to the left here, the fixed point will be unstable away from this fixed point. On the other hand, the gradient on this one here is shallow, right? It's lower than the, right, the red curve. So this gradient being shallow, or less than one, tells you that this fixed point is stable. And that's indeed what you're seeing from these iterates. They're getting closer and closer to zero, yeah? Okay, so now what happens when we, you begin to pump up this value of mu? Well, when mu is uh, 0.1, this, this graph, by the way, is a little bit hard to see, but here we go. When mu is 0.1, well, if mu is basically equal to zero, right? Then if mu is equal to zero, then you know, if I go back to this equation here, it's a bit harder to see. Uh, sorry, <laughs> okay, l l let me explain uh, from the picture again. So this fixed point here, this fixed point that was previously on the left, begins to move towards the origin as mu changes and tends to zero. That's what you're seeing here. It's quite difficult to see from the diagram because from the diagram, the intersection is happening so close to zero. When mu emerges from the right-hand side, if I change this to be plus two instead, you can see it's easier to have it plus three because of the scale of the diagram. Then you see that zero remains a fixed point of the system, but now the fixed point lies on the other side of mu. It was previously on the left side. Now it's on the right side. Moreover, you see from the gradient of the function, you see the blue curve here has a steep gradient, right? It's steeper than the red. So you know that this fixed point at the origin is gonna be unstable. And you also know that this fixed point here, this one's shallow, this has a shallow gradient, right? Less than the red. You know this one will be a, a, a stable, okay? So according to this picture, right? Let's flip back here to the board. This seems to be an example where prior to the bifurcation point on the left here, one of these two curves was unstable, whereas the other one was stable like this. But actually when you pass that point, the stability changes. What was previously stable is now unstable, and what was previously unstable is now stable. So the transcritical bifurcation is an example where you go from two fixed points to two fixed points. No fixed points disappear on either side of that special point, but you go from unstable to stable or from stable to unstable. There's stability switches. That's the second canonical example of the bifurcations that we're going to finish up um, on Wednesday's class. Okay, thank you very much. See you next time. Oh, that's an excellent question. Is there, how, what's the meaning behind the terminology transcritical and saddle node? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I have to look at that up. Well, a saddle point, uh, a saddle point, saddle point.
a saddle point from a multi-dimensional calculus, right? If you have a function of f of x and y, a saddle point is a point where if you walk um, to the critical point in a one direction, you go up like a max, you see. This is a saddle, this is a saddle point, right? Uh, can I draw it? Let's see. So a saddle point is a surface, a saddle point of a two-dimensional function, f of x and y, is a point where if you walk towards the point along one direction, one, along one path, you go up to a max and you come back down to a min. Whereas if, if you go from the other path, uh, you're, 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 so you see this is a min here, but along a, a different direction, it's a max. It must be related to that classification, but I don't, can't say it any further than that. Transcritical, I'm not sure. Draw a saddle point. All right, see you all next time.